Good morning and happy Sabbath. Uh, it is uh, my uh, privilege to stand before you just to highlight a couple of uh, items before we begin our, our prayer session this morning. I know that we are a little bit light in the church, but it's because there is a summit going on with a conference, and I do pray that they are having their good time and as we worship the Lord this morning. Uh, this morning, we're going to go through the uh, items uh, real quickly. Um, from uh, March the 29th through the 31st, Hope Channel Canada will be uh, uh, running a series called to Crown, or to, to Crown of Glory. And there's a video that's going to be played for you, if you'd please just pay attention to that. Is the video ready? God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, but he brought us peace, and by his wounds we're healed. Because of his love, he wore a crown of thorns so that we could share in his glory. There's no greater love than this, that a person will lay down his life for his friends. Hope Channel Canada presents From Crown of Thorns to Crown of Glory, a four-part series with Dr. Mansfield Edwards, showing how love conquers everything, even death. Watch it March 29th through 31st at 7 p.m. Eastern and 7 p.m. Pacific. For more information, visit www.meethope.ca. Only on Hope Channel Canada. I know it's going to be exciting. Uh, on April, the, the weekend of April the 26th through the 28th will be the King's Way Preview Weekend. I uh, just wanted to, to make sure that you make that note. Uh, also, uh, coming up the uh, weekend of April the 28th at the International Center in Mississauga is the Earth Summit, which will be in the Orion Ballroom from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., and I believe there's a video for that as well. Behold the beauty of our planet, a masterpiece crafted by the hands of the Creator. From the majestic peaks of snow-capped mountains to the gentle embrace of rolling hills, from the tranquil shores of glistening lakes to the rhythmic dance of cascading waterfalls. The earth reveals the boundless wonders of its design. In the tapestry of existence, every thread tells the story of creation, of order and of purpose. Please mark that event as well. And from the uh, Durham fire uh, for the timeout fundraiser, and note the date change to April the 7th. Uh, the registration and QR code is a fun day with great stations for kids to play in a safe environment. Parents, guardians can relax, shop, see a movie, or get some spring cleaning done while kids have fun with us. All proceeds will go towards the company this summer. We want the pathfinders to have a wonderful time. And so we want to make sure that you mark that calendar. Let's share this out. It's a, it's a digital flyer, so it's very easy for you to save it to your computer. 
and share it by email to your friends to invite others. Uh, next one is the Mind Fit, which is coming up. You have heard about this from Thursday, April the 4th to Sunday, April the 7th. And here's what we are we asking you to do. Uh, as you can see, uh, there is uh, an invite uh, that you got. Uh, if you saw the Dickens in, you'll see an invite that was there, invitation that you can share out. Uh, you know, that, that, is, uh, that is, is, is for you to invite others. And then the next card is for you to pray for those that you are inviting. I'm going to go through that again. So one is the invite, uh, you know, which looks like this and has a QR code on the back. And then next is uh, a card with the lines where you can pray for those whom you are inviting. And then... The last one is really, uh, uh, you know, uh, the form that needs to come back to us. Please complete it. If you don't have these three, make sure you see a deacon at the back. Uh, maybe he can go around, just raise your hand if you don't have those, and he'll bring those to you. So, deacons, please just take a minute. Anybody that didn't get the cards, just raise your hand. Somebody at the back. Okay, okay, yeah, please uh, make sure that you grab one uh, so that uh, you can uh, participate in this upcoming series. God bless you, happy Sabbath, and remember that we enter to worship and we depart to serve. Happy Sabbath, church. Alex Rodriguez here, associate speaker at The Voice of Prophecy. We're delighted that you've chosen to partner with us at the VOP and with hundreds of churches across North America through our mental health event entitled MindFit. This co-presented documentary and Bible study has been designed to minister to the needs in your church and in the community in such a way as to place your church at the forefront of health and healing and to pique the interest of the attendees about what other resources and opportunities you and your church might offer. Here's the way this works. We've created four 30-minute on-location presentations in documentary style. Your guest will first view the film, then transition to a short Bible study on the topic that we've prepared for your pastor or host to lead out in. Program one deals with destigmatizing mental health. In program two, we define the top three mental illness issues plaguing our current society, depression, anxiety, and trauma. Program three looks at historical and modern treatments for these illnesses and also presents some exciting emerging treatments. At the end of program three, we will suggest that there is one more thing that many are finding helpful. This sets us up for program four, where we'll briefly tell the great controversy story, including the war in heaven, the fall of Lucifer, creation of man, and the fall of man. In this program, we suggest that there was an ideal where we were created perfect and without disease. Humanity rejected that ideal in Genesis 3, resulting in sickness and disease that we have today, including mental illness. But what if we were to go back to the ideal? Would that help in the healing process? Program four is designed to connect the physical with the spiritual and suggest to the listener that turning to God is a viable and essential option towards healing. To complement the presentations, we partnered with Pacific Press's health magazine Vibrant Life and created four magazines to correspond with each night's presentations. As an attendance gift and for further study and reflection, each attendee or family can be given a magazine as they exit the hall at the end of the presentation. During each program, I'll be pitching your church as a wonderful resource center for health and healing. To that extent, these studies are a perfect tool to use as a follow-up to the event. Kurt Johnson's Bible study called Peace is an Inside Job. And that's pretty much it. It's as easy as that. Plug and play. We've provided everything for your success. All you need to do is inform your community of the event through the use of our marketing resources and ask the Lord to bless. 
I encourage you to start praying today for your community to be receptive and so that God will place in your hearts the people that he would have you invite. Thanks again for your faithful partnership. Together, we can bring healing to the broken. Thank you. Hello, welcome College Park family. It's good to see everyone who's made it here. We managed to make it out of the snow this morning. Um, I think we all, we all got reminded that we're, we're still in Canada and spring, spring always has some surprises for us. Um, <laughs> anyways, um, it's, it's good to see everyone who's here this morning and I hope that, that um, you've, you've made it through a, a good week and that you're here ready to worship this morning. I'd like to welcome everyone who's watching with us online and our, um, our pioneers at the Pioneer Apartments. Welcome to worship this morning. Um, I invite the congregation to stand for the call to worship, um, which I will be taking from Psalms, one, Psalms chapter 111. And it says, Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. His work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He has given food to those who fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. He has declared to his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. Um, so I'd just like the congregation to remember what it is that God has done for us this uh, through, through our lives th this morning as we come to worship and 
praise him. I'll, I'll now pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here this morning to worship. Thank you for bringing us through all the struggles that we've had this week. And now please, please be with us as we enter into an attitude of worship. And please help us to remember who you are and what you have done for us so that we can, we can praise you. And yeah, just be with us all this morning so that we can um, worship you with our whole bodies in spirit and in truth. Thank you in Jesus' name, amen. I invite the congregation to remain standing for the opening hymn. Good morning. I love the sunshine, don't you? And I love the whiteness. Let's turn to pay, uh, 10 for our opening song, Come Christians Join to Sing. to invite all the children up for their, their, their uh, story. Come and meet in the front here. What time is it? Hooray! Sorry, uh, a small correction on that. It's a video, so if, if the children would just stay in their seats for the, for the video this morning. kids and happy sabbath it's great to see you guys again welcome back to camp zion i'm emily and i'm danny before we get started i'd like to ask you guys to go like and subscribe to the cpc channel to make sure that you do not miss another live stream so in today's lesson we'll be talking about what it what are what are we supposed to be talking about what it means to be a disciple what it means to be a disciple what does that mean? Well, a disciple is a student or a learner. And as we know, back in Jesus' time, disciples followed and learned about Jesus' life here on earth and the miracles that he did. As we know, our mission here on earth from God is to be fishers of men. In other words, it is to make disciples of Jesus. Well, how do we make disciples of Jesus? As we read in the Bible, we see that Jesus spent time with people. 
If we spend time with people, we get to know people and we share more and more about ourselves. By sharing more about ourselves and our beliefs, we can encourage others to follow Jesus just like we do. To demonstrate this lesson, we conducted an experiment where we used three glasses, two filled with water, two pieces of paper towel, and yellow and blue food color. This experiment shows how discipleship works because as we can see, the middle glass starts off empty with no water or without knowledge of Jesus. The two glasses on either side are filled with knowledge of Jesus. And as we can see, they transfer the water through the paper towel to the empty cup. As the empty cup gains knowledge of Jesus, that disciple learns more. And eventually, once they all reach an equal knowledge, that disciple can go and make more disciples by sharing his knowledge of the gospel and Jesus to others. Our verse today is taken from Matthew 28, verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. As we follow through with the mission that Jesus sent us on, we have to reach out to as many people as possible, whether it's through recordings like this one, to singing hymns on the side of the street, or to setting up Bible studies for friends for their friends. We need to remember to reach out to as many people as we can, sharing the knowledge of Jesus with others. Thank you guys so much for joining us again today. We hope to see you next time. Goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, so just a quick clarification, thank you for my brother for asking. The uh, MindFit series will be a hybrid series. Uh, there will be a component, a component where it will be in videos and then there will be a Bible study component that will be in person. I just wanted to make sure that that's, that's clear. Uh, now it's time for us to worship our God with our offerings. And this morning, the offering is for the conference advance, the Ontario conference advance. Uh, I don't know about you, but one of my favorite things is that I'm looking forward to this spring is to finally get out of the house. I put my walking shoes on. I feel heavy. I feel like I've not done enough. And, uh, you know, as we exercise uh, our relationship with God, we know that God blesses us. Uh, through what we give to the conference. The conference is putting up a lot of programs. They are planning a lot of things that need your support. And by supporting your conference, we know that God is going to bless his, his work. Let us pray together for the offering. Father in heaven, everything that we have is yours. Many times we forfeit our blessings because we forget to put our priorities right. So, Lord, I ask that even in our worship, that we'll prioritize you first. I thank you for the men and women that are under the sound of my voice. I thank you for the men and women and families that support your church so wholeheartedly. Father, I pray that they all lack in nothing. That as they put you first, blessings will overflow in their homes. Thank you for your listening to our prayers. In your precious name we ask. Amen. Deacons. Aung Ko, born into a very devout Buddhist family, may seem an unlikely church leader. At the age of seven, he began to suffer from a disease in one of his eyes. Despite his anguish, his parents couldn't afford to take him to a clinic, and the other eye was infected too. Anko's condition worsened until, as a teenager, he became completely blind. After seventh grade, he was unable to continue his studies. Adrift and depressed, Anko saw nothing but emptiness before him and attempted suicide several times. One day, when Anko was almost 30, a Christian evangelist came to his village and talked to people about Jesus' power to lift people out of despair. As a result of the preacher's messages, Ong Ko and his family were baptized into a Christian church. Unable to read, 
Onko turned to audio sources for information, and that search led him to Adventist World Radio, AWR. He listened to the radio daily, doing his best to capture every detail. As his knowledge about God grew, Onko called his neighbors and formed a small group, which soon began to meet regularly. With his easygoing ways, Onko has become a popular speaker and respected leader. He founded a community service group, the Golden Eagle Handicap Foundation, which helps people in need in and around the community. I am very happy that I have come to know God and the truth of the Sabbath, said Anko. Without the message that the radio taught me, my life would make no sense. The Adventist World Radio, AWR, currently broadcasts in over a hundred languages and has led thousands of people to understand and accept the distinctive truths for this time. Every time you distribute your regular offering as suggested by the combined offering plan, 20% of your offering goes to the World Mission Fund, which helps to support different missionary agencies like the Adventist World Radio. But if in addition to that, you are impressed by God to send a special offering to the AWR, you may access awr.org slash support slash donate and make your donation. As we return our tithe and offerings, may we put our desires last and God first. I would invite the congregation to please kneel with me as we seek the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we come before you and recognize that you are a holy God and a God who is worthy of all of our worship and praise. Lord, we're, we're thankful that you that despite you're holy, that you, you don't hold our record of wrong against us as long as we um, accept the blood, blood of Jesus as our righteousness, and that you, you won't keep a record of our wrong and, and prevent us from coming to worship you. Lord, we're um, grateful for all of that you have done in giving us your son so that he, um, to die on the cross so that we, we can have your righteousness and we can come before you and worship you. Um, so, Lord, please, please continue to, to help us to recognize where the areas in our lives where we're, we're falling short and help us to get back on the path to draw closer to you, Lord. Um, Lord, we also want to thank you for all that you've, you've done personally for us in our lives, um, all of the blessings that we have, our food, um, access to water, um, our, our families, our vehicles, and all of the other blessings that you have poured out on us. Lord, thank you for all that you have given us. Um, at the same time, we have some, some requests that we want to bring before you. I know that there are some, some members in our church who are dealing with um, the loss of loved ones, some who have heard some tragic news that, that one of their loved ones is, is, has just contracted some uh, terrible disease. Um, so please, please be with all those who are in that position and help them to know that you are still with them and no matter what, you will, you will be with them and guide them through whatever pain it is that they may be going through. And God, maybe there, there are others of our church who are suffering um, in, a, in a bit of a financial situation right now. Please, please be with them and help bless them and guide them so that they, they can continue to, to praise you as well. Lord, we know that there's so many things going on across the world. There's continuing wars and other global conflicts. Um, so please be with all of the leaders and help, help them to be able to work together to find a solution that can bring lasting peace. Um, yeah, God, God, please be with, with us who are gathered here as well and help us, help us to draw closer to you continually day by day. And please be with Pastor Martin as he preaches. Help, us, help him to deliver a word that will inspire us to do just that, to draw closer to you every day. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning and happy Sabbath, church family. Our scripture reading for today is found in the book of Joel, chapter 2, verses 10 to 13. Joel, chapter 2, verses 10 to 13. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon grow dark, and the stars diminish their brightness. The Lord gives voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for strong is the one who executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. May God bless the reading of his word. Happy Sabbath, church. Um, this song that I'm about to sing is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I pray that you're blessed. <clears throat> Taking advantage 
advantage of your love and grace. Forgive me, Lord, and take me home. Take me home. I'm running to you, Jesus. Please take me home. You see, I've been on this road way too long, and I can't do right anymore. I'm tired of pain, and I don't like fear. But Lord, I want to be more sincere. I never should have left your side. Return me to your guiding light. I'm running back to you. I see your stairs in there for me. Your arms are open wide. And I don't have to cry no more. You're standing there for me. And I Amen. Thank you, Oliver. Brother, you can sing, man. Thank you. That was powerful. All right. It's good to be back. Um, I realized um, that the message didn't go out or, you know, you guys didn't know. All of a sudden, you know, Pastor Martin's missing. Had a little bit of uh, trouble with appendicitis and um, so I took a, a little bit of time to, to recover from that. I'm doing much better, but, uh, you know, still a little sore. You know, I guess I'm not bouncing back like I used to. You know, I, I came in the door and uh, Mark and I were reminiscing of better days where, you know, you get away with, you know, a little bit of abuse and, you know, you just bounce back. So, but, uh, but that's okay, you know. It's... Uh, we get the privilege of getting older and wiser, hopefully, right? And so we trade that in a little bit. Before I get started, I uh, wanted to share a couple of things here. Uh, one is for our visitors. Uh, if there's any visitors, um, this isn't a church where you can just sneak in and sneak out unnoticed. We want to see your face. We want to see you, we want to greet you, we want to welcome you if you haven't been welcomed already. Uh, and we also want to give you a little gift, you know, a little bit of an enticement so that you come back. <laughs> so uh, please meet us up front uh, at the end of the service. Uh, we'd like to shake your hand and say hello. And uh, no strings attached, you know, seven minutes or less. We'll just, you know, we don't want to take too much time, but we do want to do meet you. Uh, I did want to pray for, uh, oh, one more thing, a potluck at the end for visitors as well as new transfers. There's potluck this, uh, this afternoon right after church, uh, so please feel free uh, to stop and, uh, and fellowship. Um, there are a couple prayer requests. Uh, one is for Tim Aka. He's a longtime member here, uh, did great things for, uh, for Camp Frenda. Uh, he wrote a book, right? And so that's pretty impressive. Yeah, I could only dream of doing something like that. Um, very knowledgeable man, very, uh, very committed, very down-to-earth person. And um, it, it turns out he, they just discovered he has stage four cancer. Uh, and so we want to lift him up in prayer. I know there's a few members in our own congregation that are, that are suffering as well. I want to lift up uh, Lori Dukes as well. She's having a little bit of, uh, of an issue as well. Um, 
family members. I don't want to name any more names, but there are people in our midst who are uh, losing relatives, loved ones, uh, as well to uh, these horrible diseases, right? Um, so I just wanted to pause before I get started to, to say a prayer for them and bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for this lovely day. And even though it seems like we received an UNO reverse card and all of a sudden we're in winter again, the sun is shining and we're reminded of, of how you blanket us with your righteousness. And that warms our heart and we're so very grateful. We'll even put up with the cold and the snow. But Lord, our heart is heavy for those that we love, members of our church, longtime members of our church and, and family. Um, they're going through a lot. Illness um, seems to have no boundaries, and it just comes. And we understand, mentally, we understand that it's a consequence of sin, but when it hits home, it breaks our heart. And so I want to lift up uh, Tim Aka in this new discovery. It, it, the whole family is shocked. And I pray for him, Lord, that you bless him, that if it be your will, we ask, Lord, for healing. But most of all, we pray that in his heart, he has you, Lord. Because having you, he can go through anything. And I pray, Lord, for Lori, who's having some difficulties with her eyes. And, and I pray a blessing on her and the family. Uh, for the rest of our members who are also ill, Lord, there are so many and for those of us that are, have lost loved ones recently or maybe on the verge of losing someone, I pray for them, that you comfort them, that you let them know that you're walking with them through these troubling times. And so, Lord, having said that, we place ourselves in your hands, Lord. I, I pray that whatever message comes out of my lips today may be a blessing for all, that you may... <laughs> that you may touch the hearts, Lord, and, and go ahead of the words and, and prepare the grounds to receive whatever message that you have for us today. So please be with us, Father. Forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us, Lord, and, and raise us up. We ask all of this in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's, uh, let's start off by reading some scripture Recently, I got into um, studying the book of Joel, and, um, and I just needed to share, share, share a message that was laid on my heart. And so we'll pick up uh, the verse here, uh, chapter 1, and we're going to be reading 2 to 12. It says, Hear this, you elders, and give ear all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left the consuming locust has eaten. Awake, you drunkards, and weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it has been cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. His teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the fangs of a fierce lion. He has laid waste my vine and ruined my fig tree. He has stripped it bare and thrown it away. Its branches are made white. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering have been cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn who minister to the Lord. The field is wasted, the land mourns, for the grain is ruined, the new wine is dried up, the oils fail. Be ashamed, 
you farmers, wail, you vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. The vine has dried up, and the fig tree has withered, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree. All the trees of the field are withered. Surely joy has withered away from the sons of men. Joel describes a time when Israel was in a state of loss. The book isn't clear as to when or during what period this wasting away happened. All we know for sure is that Israel had been particularly rebellious, and everything they had had been stripped, had been taken away through trouble and disasters. The prophet's call, uh, cry called Israel to awaken, to lament, to be ashamed of how far they had drifted from God in their apathy and rebelliousness. We're not given details as to how this all happened, how long it took, or how long they had been in such a state. But all of a sudden, they found themselves being stripped of everything. Nothing was spared. Everything that mattered to them, everything that was important to them, had been taken away. All of this trouble was a test of faith, warning, a wake-up call to return to God before the future final judgment came. The prophet's voice echoed the Lord's clarion call to wake up and heed the warning before it was too late. God was calling them to turn back to him in contrition, to realize how far they had drifted. He urged them to consecrate themselves afresh, to renew their commitment to him. He was trying to save them from themselves. I'm wondering, have you ever experienced in your life a period where everything that mattered to you, you seem to Lose. Like everything that was dear began to slip like grains of sand through your fingers. And no matter how tightly you would grip it, it just kept going faster and faster and you were left with, with nothing. This is what was happening to Israel. They didn't understand where they were, what was going on, but everything, even their sustenance, their food was being stripped from them. This brings to mind a period of time. I was about to graduate from CUC with my religious studies degree. Now, for those of you who may not know, I've gone through a very long tri um, journey to get to that point. I ran from the call maybe three, four times. I was a real Jonah. And maybe there's still a little bit of that spirit in me now, but, but I ran, and God would bring me back. And when I finally surrendered, I said, all right, Lord, this time, this time I'm going to do it. And so I graduated. I was, I was looking at graduation. And part of the graduation process is the conference presidents will come down to CUC or up to CUC, depending which direction you're coming from. And they will interview all the you know, new students. And I thought to myself, ah, this is a sure thing. I mean, God has relentlessly chased me. He's like, I'm not letting you go, man. I don't care what you do. You're coming with me. And so I'm like, okay, that's awesome. You know, I, for sure, you know, a conference is going to see that and be like, all right, so you're going to be with us. Or maybe they'd be knocking down my door. Hey, we want you to work with us. And, but nothing. I got to graduation, not a word. We did the interviews and they seemed positive and everything was great. And nothing and I prayed. I'm like, Lord, what's going on? 
What's going on? Graduation day came and nothing. I had to scramble. I'm like, what am I going to do? I can't just not do something. And it dawned on me, it's like, well, you know, if, if I can't find work, then I got to continue in school. I got to keep going. I got to keep moving forward. And so I started searching around, and I found a new program at Loma Linda. You know, they were starting a chaplaincy program. They were kicking it off that very year. And I said, Lord, if this is your will, but I wasn't getting anything. He wasn't talking to me. You know, I was so busy just going through the motions and, and trying to, you know, do my best and convince people and, you know, just do it myself that I was too busy maybe to hear from God. But really, he didn't speak to me during that time. Heaven was quiet and I didn't understand. So, you know, I applied. I said, Lord, if this is your will, I'll do it. I'm not sure. I mean, it would take me away from pastoral work, pastoral ministry, and going into chaplaincy, and I got support for my wife, and she's like, yeah, you know, I think you'd be a great chaplain. And I said, all right, we'll give it a shot. The only problem is I couldn't take my family with me. Amy wasn't Canadian, so we had to go. I mean, he was an American, so we... We had to apply for residency and like getting her paperwork and everything, and and we had no place to live. We were gonna stay at a at one of her cousin's house there in California, and you know we went through the process. And so I sent my family, my you know baby family. Hero was very little. Sky was really young, maybe six months old. Was he? Yeah. So I sent Amy and the kids to Ontario so she can have support from her family. And I went to California. I still remember the night that I, the night before I left. It was one of the saddest things I had ever experienced. One of. We had loaded this little box trailer that, that I had bought with just the remains of our stuff. It wasn't even that much. And I was sleeping on this air mattress in the living room, and, and I felt so down. I didn't understand where was God. Why was there silence? I didn't understand why I was going through this trouble. Nothing. And I got so sad. Tears were flowing from my face, and... I could just, my mind, my imagination must have taken over because all I could see was the kids running around the apartment and all the fun times we had. And I felt so lonely and lost and I didn't know why God wasn't telling me what my next step was. They were already in Ontario here and I was still in Alberta and I was miserable and all I had was a pile of junk in a box trailer that I was going to haul to California. Everything had been stripped in that moment. And I didn't understand. I went down to California and um, met up with her family and they took me in and that was, that was awesome. They were great people. And I had time. I had time on my hands to think and to pray and to work out this frustration that I felt, I didn't understand why this was happening to me. And God, through his mercy, put people in my life during that time to help me talk it out and, and help me get out the angst and the frustration and, and maybe a little bit of resentment and, and help me to focus on what was important. You see, God wasn't done with me, but he gave me that, troubled, that troubling time so that he can see, he can test my faith and see what my reaction would be. Was I still relying on my own thinking, my own manipulations, my own, you know, trying to work things out, my self-reliance? Was he trying, he was trying to point all of that out. That before I got into ministry for real, I needed to let go and understand that it was he who was going to work through me. Not me, myself. Not my own hand, not my strength. And so it was difficult. And it took me a while. It took me a few years. 
And it wasn't until I finally realized that I needed to totally surrender and be okay with whatever the will of God was in my life that the doors began to open. You know, in the inland desert of Redlands in San Bernardino, I toiled with what was happening. I felt as though God had taken everything from me, like I had been stripped, like life had eaten away my joy and everything that mattered to me. I didn't understand how I got to this crossroads. I didn't understand God's plan or his reasoning. I was discouraged, and there were moments when I just wanted to give everything up. But I had a choice to make. I was being asked to make this choice. What would I do? Would I turn from God and abandon the call after all he had done, after all the work that had to be done in me? Would I abandon all the years of struggle and hard work? Or would I rebel? Or would I press harder towards him? in faith that things would eventually change, to trust in his wisdom, his call, and his plan for my life? Would I humble myself and lean on his sovereignty over my life? All of these questions needed to be answered in that particular time. I did not appreciate at that time that God had a reason for allowing this to happen. This trouble I was experiencing was an unmistakable call. It was a sobering reality. The sobering reality is that in the midst of our troubles, at some point, we must realize that we are being called to choose between two options. One, In the face of our troubles, we can harden our hearts and we can dig our heels in. And we can outright rebel. We can become angry and resentful. We can hold a grudge against God for allowing such troubles and pain and suffering to enter our lives. Or two, which is perhaps the simplest, believe it or not, yet exponentially more difficult for us is to humble ourselves and to turn to God and to trust in Him. Blinded by the discomfort and pain, we often miss the fact that Hardships, problems, issues, troubles in life serve a purpose in the greater scheme of things. In the broader picture of our life, it is Jesus' mission to get you to that finish line. Now, everybody wants to go to heaven, right? Everyone who's here has that, that desire, that expectation. And when we ask God, do whatever it takes, Just get me there. He's going to say, all right. And now I can get working. Because you see, sin is so entrenched in us that sometimes it takes these crazy things to happen to us so that we realize that the only one we can depend on is God. And so that stripping away the troubles that we face, strip away the pride, strip away the self-reliance, And it teaches us to depend on God and to trust in his goodness in the face of those troubles. Unfortunately, what tends to happen is we get chummy with sin. We easily forget that behind every sin is pain and death. So easily we become self-indulgent and self-sufficient up until we are the victims, of course, of sin. Then we look at it with disgust. We're like, oh, sin, oh, you know? 
we're all disgusted. And we turn to God, and we're like, oh, God, why is this happening to me? I'm a good person. I go to church. I'm a deacon. I'm an elder. I lead out in children's ministry. I do this. I do that. I pay my tithe. I, I, I gave that bum in the corner some money the other day. Why, God? Why is this happening to me? Trouble brings to mind our absolute need for a Savior. It is the perfect reminder that we need God. Troubles give us a dose of reality by reminding us of the greater cosmic war between Christ and Satan and keeps the realities of war between light and darkness fresh in our mind because we're, we like the status quo. We like to have this homeostasis, and so we don't want to be disturbed. We just want to live our lives. We want to get up and go to work. We want to come home, be able to spend time with our family, have meals, be good, have good health, enjoy a vacation here and there. And we forget. We forget that all around us is this immense war between good and evil. But best of all, our troubles are meant to call us back to God, to see Him as all we need, for He is our great reward. One such individual that went through seasons of stripping and trouble was Abraham. I mean, he went through all that trouble to finally have a son. And then God says, okay, I know you love your son. This is the son whom you love. I want you to give him to me. Could you imagine the turmoil, the heartache that went through Abraham's mind when God was trying to take the one thing that he had looked forward to all his life into his old age? And God said, give it to me. Sacrifice your son. You know what? Abraham had gone through enough with God to know that he can trust his plan. All the trouble that Abraham had in his past life taught him that in that moment he could still trust God. And I love the words of Genesis 15:1. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. It wasn't the promise of a seed that would cover the earth, of, of, of a family, of children that would just go on without end. God himself was Abraham's reward. And it was the trouble that helped them see that. God allowed trouble in Abram's life so that the Lord could get him to see that a relationship with God was the actual reward. The, promise, the promises God had made to him were just added blessings. They were a bonus. My brothers and sisters, even if our time on earth ends and the trouble that we are facing here is not resolved, God himself has given us the promise that greater is the reward that comes in Christ's hand than any trouble that we could face here on earth. Amen? Amen. Romans 8.18 for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Hallelujah. Amen. Man, I'm getting fired up. This is awesome. 
Another benefit of the clear call of trouble is that it helps us realize that we are part of a people in the same boat. We are not above others. And just because we're doing okay now, it doesn't mean that down the line it's going to stay the same. We all share in this same experience of having to deal with sin in our lives and the consequences of sin in our lives. Affliction truly is a common human experience. But my brothers and sisters, what makes the real difference is how we react to that trouble. Again, I ask, what will we do if we find ourselves at the receiving end of this manner of call? Well, we see it as it is a perfect opportunity to turn wholeheartedly to our God and to humble ourselves recognizing our utter dependence upon him and submit to his plan, submit to his sovereignty in our life. Or, well, we get get obstinate, thick-headed, stiff-necked, as the Bible says, driven by pride, refusing to let go of our ego and self-interest. The prophet speaks of a salvific component to trouble and suffering. It is God's sure and unmistakable calling. It's a warning to turn us around and back into a right relationship with him before the actual final judgment comes and seals the matter for eternity. In a very real sense, trouble is meant to save us. My brothers and sisters, make no mistake, the day of the Lord is sure and at hand. Judgment is coming. It will come whether we are ready or not. We can't go to God and say, well, I didn't know this was coming or else I would have gotten ready. It doesn't work that way. You got to live every single day as if you're in that mode. You can't expect God to say, oh, well, you know, in about five years, you're going to start to feel a little funny. All of a sudden, you're going to wake up with these strange pains you've never had before. And then all of a sudden, you're going to go to the doctor, and the doctor's like, hey, you've only got six months to live. So why don't you start preparing right now? He's not going to do that. He's going to tell you right now through the word, through the words of Joel, you got to be ready. You got to turn to God. And if it takes you going through a series of issues, of troubles, of problems for you to turn your face back to God, then it was worth it. So what must we do? What do we do? Joel gives us the warning. The Bible gives us the warning. You better turn around. You better get right with God. You got to have a relationship with him. What do we do? First and foremost, we need to take stock and wake up. We need to realize what's happening, that it's not so much about the issue that we're facing, although as painful and as troubling as it could be, it's about waking up and realizing that you need God and that you need to draw with all your strength, all your might, wholehearted, open, genuine vulnerability in his presence and say, God, I am yours. Do your will in my life. We need to wake up. Dr. Phil famously coined, you can't change what you don't acknowledge. All change in our life can only happen when we recognize that it is the need, it is needed, and are willing to be held accountable. 
Trouble is a call meant to rouse us, to sober us up, and point us back to a right relationship with God. Realize that this trouble you're facing is an unmistakable call. Because no matter how much we, design, we deem ourselves okay or pretty good or maybe not that bad, there is still this definite growth that we need to reach. Because when we compare ourselves to other people, it's easy to fall under that illusion, right? It's like, oh, well, it's, look at that guy, man. Look at sister. Oh, my. You see what he's wearing today? Skirt over here. Uh, earrings all, you know. All that bling, all that makeup. <laughs> but when we compare ourselves to Jesus, right? We look at Jesus and we keep our eyes on Jesus. We see. We see that we're not all right. And even though we carry this mask, you know, sometimes we carry that mask to church, you know, people ask you, hey, how you doing? I'm perfect. God is good. And then inside you're dying. But when we compare ourselves to Jesus, we see just how far we need to go. It is crucial to recognize that this trouble you're facing is an opportunity to grow your faith experience and to create in you a spiritual resilience. And the best thing to do is embrace it. I'm so proud of my brother. Actually, yesterday was his birthday. And he reminded me of his time in the Marines. He, had, he spent some time in the Marines, and uh, it was challenging. It was really taxing on him as a person. Because the military, what they do is they try to tear you down in boot camp so that they can build you up into a soldier. Because that training is, is meant to help you survive the rigors of war. And in 2003, when the Marines were in Iraq, there's this saying that sort of really, really got popular. It was probably coined before then, but it really became popular. And ex please forgive the expression, but it's embrace the suck. That was their... That was how they were able to meet just the crazy circumstances, the chaos of war. It encouraged them to take the trouble and the hardship for an opportunity to grow stronger and to develop. They were able to develop strategies and overcome difficulties because war is incredibly difficult. And I don't think any of us, or most of us, I should say, can attest, have experienced. We might have a few in our audience that have. Embracing the suck taught them to expect that things won't always be easy, but it was up to them to take up courage and continue forward despite how they felt. Embracing the suck teaches you to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. When you're facing difficulties, challenges, and problems in life, embracing your troubles call, uh, tr troubles call as an opportunity to grow a tighter bond with God no matter what happens. It is how you will grow in your faith experience and your relationship with Christ. We'll continue reading in Joel it says, now, therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Surrender your heart 
and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. And he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and nursing babes. Let the bridegroom come out of his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Do you listen to his call? Can you sense that yearning in that voice? The troubles you face, my brothers and sisters, are a call to return to God. The prophet gives us guidance also. He doesn't just tell us, okay, so you just got to turn back to God. Well, then how do we do it, Joel? We need to recognize the call and turn to God. We need to wake up. We need to repent We need to repent of our sins, the hidden sins, the ones that maybe we have been trying to shove into the closet so that nobody, not even our own eyes, will see it. We need to consecrate ourselves. We need to minister and advocate and intercede for others. So often we're so entangled, so... Um, narrow, like we get tunnel vision, right? We get into some trouble, we get into some issues, the pain and all the chaos that happens gives us this tunnel vision and, and we just think that life then revolves around us. But the reality is that once again, we are all in this together and we need to advocate for one another. And this is for for all of us, but also for our leaders here in church, starting for myself. There's a responsibility for us as leaders, as spiritual leaders, to take up the call, to intercede, to hold people accountable for their sins and call for repentance and consecration. There's an imperative to restore the house of God to give thanks and to have compassion over those under our care. We have a responsibility to hold the body of Christ accountable. We need to be able to call you out on your shenanigans in a loving way, of course. All too often we shy away because we've had a history of abusing that responsibility of using it to to manipulate, to to cause harm, to to create a sense of, of hierarchy. But here's the catch, my brothers and sisters. That relationship, it's up to you. You have to allow us to be able to do that, to speak into your lives, to challenge you and hold you accountable. We need to have each other's backs. If you see your brother failing, making these mistakes, you have a responsibility to say, hey, what's going on? Is there anything I can help you with? Is there anything we can do? I want to help you overcome this thing that you have in your life that doesn't belong there. Because that's what it's like to be a family. It's not just coming into the room. It's not just being here to pray together, to to sing together, to listen to the sermon together. No. Church is about the relationships. That's church. 
Each and every one of us helping each other out, helping each other grow to Jesus, towards Jesus. That's what it means to be part of the family of God. But you have to allow that relationship to happen. You have to give us that permission to speak into your life. Then, then, this word is a word of hope. Joel just doesn't reprimand Israel and say, naughty, naughty. No, he says, you do this. And then, then you're going to see something happen. Verse 26, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my main men servants and maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. If you heed his call, my brothers and sisters, if you, if you take your troubles, your problems, whatever you're going through, your circumstances, and flip the thinking and see it for what it is, a call to return to God, then God will pour out his spirit upon you. You will be saved, my brothers and sisters. You will be restored. I don't know. I don't know what you're going through. But after the song, I want to invite you guys to come up. I have to admit, a moment of vulnerability, I'm finding myself in a bit of trouble. I'm wrestling with something. It has caused me to reflect on this very path that God has taken me. And I got to say, I came close to saying, okay, God, maybe this time I'm done for sure. But then I was asked to do something that has caused me to reflect on my journey. And I had to repent. I realized that I was making this life about me. That I was making ministry about how it made me feel. And with tearful eyes, I had to, I had to ask for forgiveness. Because I realized that this whole thing, this whole ministry, this whole call that I have received, it's not about me and what I can do. It's about what God is going to use me to do. And so I had to say, sorry, God. So I don't know what you're going through, but if you're going through difficulty, at the end of the song, I want you guys to come up. I want to pray together. I want to pray for you. I, I have your spiritual back. But you need to do the work inside your heart. You need to know that this issue, that these problems, that whatever you're facing, it's a challenge to wake you up and, and help you to just regain an appreciation for how much you need Jesus. 
And so during the song, if you'd like to make your way down from up there or would like to come up when the song is up, I want to pray with you. I say with you because I need it too. The closing song is 297. God be merciful to me. Can we all stand? going through difficulties, trouble, please come forward. <clears throat> I hope 
that you can see that we're in this together. You have brothers and sisters who are struggling too. And I hope that you gain encouragement because you guys are in the right place. You're coming forward to the throne of grace and you're saying, Lord, I'm claiming that promise. God is good. Amen. Amen. And he's not going to let you down. And he knows. He sees you right now. He sees you're hurting. He sees your pain. He knows. He knows. You're not surprising him with anything. If you're struggling, he knows. He knew you would have these struggles even before you came to him. But he was prepared. He sent his son to die on a cross to give us all hope that in him we would be all right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we hear you. The troubles that we're facing are screaming at us. May it be financial, may it be health, may it be relational. Whatever it is, God, you know. You already know that our hearts are heavy and we're just trying to get through this day by day. But too often we lean on our own strength and we're finding that we can't, God. We can't. But you sent your word to us. Joel speaks to us and lets us know that this, this trouble is a call for us to lean on you harder because you know that we can't and we just try to deceive ourselves by believing that we stand a chance trying to fix everything with our own hands. Forgive us, God. Forgive us where we have failed you. Forgive us for holding back, for, for not giving our all to you. Forgive us as a church because we feel that we're, for, we're being stripped away too. And we need you, Jesus, to show up here in this building, in this people, to bring more souls to your side. We want to feel the passion of your spirit stir us to minister to others, to reach out. <clears throat> and so, Lord, we are here before you. All we can do is say, Lord, we surrender all. Oh, yes. Do with us what your will is. And help us never to forget that we indeed can trust in your plan for our lives. You've got us in the palm of your hand. You've, you've scribed your, our names in your hands, Lord Jesus, so we know that it's true. We know that it's permanent. You will carry the scars of our iniquity with you for all eternity so that we never forget how much you loved us. And I pray, Lord, that we allow you, all of us, that we allow you to, to work huge things in our life. Not because we want it, not because we're trying to end the pain, but because you are God. You are the creator. You are all powerful. And you know no other way than to do things great, dear God. So send us on our way today with the assurance that the troubles that we're facing is your love calling us back, letting us know that it is you that is going to see us through to the very end and not ourselves. Bless us, Lord. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah.
uh, just a quick reminder, uh, just a quick reminder, uh, our visitors uh, will be waiting for up here for seven minutes or less. So please feel free to come forward and, uh, and, and receive your little gift. God bless.